Amen. And amen. When we come to this passage of Scripture here in Acts chapter number 26, we come to a moment in time where, as we said before, the Apostle Paul has been seized. Uh, he has been uh, arrested, if you can put it that way. He has been brought to make an appeal uh, before King Agrippa. And uh, we know the story there uh, about uh, Paul's uh, being taken. Uh, he was taken, put on a ship, and he had to sail through. Uh, he's on his way after this uh, to sail through that storm, uh, Eurachlodon, that we preached on several weeks ago. But when we come to this passage, Paul is making appeals. He is uh, he's already uh, been uh, making appeals before uh, other men. The Bible tells us that he had been brought uh, before Felix in chapter number 24. Uh, he had been brought uh, a second time before Felix in chapter 24, verse 24. 24 through 26. The Bible tells us that he was brought before uh, Festus uh, and uh, was had to appeal before a man, a leader by the name of Festus. And now he is standing in front of King Agrippa in Acts chapter number 26. And he is in a position to which you and I would probably be very discouraged. Uh, he is in a place where he is having to defend himself, hoping for liberty, hoping to be let free, having done nothing wrong, have committed, having committed no crime, and the Bible says yet he is having to defend himself. Now here's the difference between you and I and the Apostle Paul. The Bible said that in that situation uh, Paul was able to be happy. He was able to be encouraged. The Bible talks about how David encouraged himself in the Lord, and I believe what we find here is the Apostle Paul doing the same thing. He encourages himself Himself in the Lord, he is happy even when he thinks about where he is and what is going on in his life. Here's the reason why he's happy: is because even though he does have to stand before a king and defend himself uh, for a crime that he has not committed for doing nothing and being accused improperly and incorrectly, he is still happy about the fact that that king is going to allow him to speak. Now, you and I would think about if. And Paul is in a position to where he has to defend himself, uh, being accused as someone that is a lawbreaker, having broken no law, having done nothing but serving the Lord. You would think that in this passage, Paul would take that opportunity and talk about his innocence. Talk about his need to be set at liberty, his need to be let go because of his innocence. But the Apostle Paul was never one to miss an opportunity. And I'm not talking about an opportunity just to speak. I know there's, uh, you know, I, I've said it before from this pulpit. I believe there's some people that call themselves preachers that preach because they have something to say from God. And uh, and there's some people that'll preach or teach or just even in our world, they'll, they'll talk either because they have something to say or they just want to say something. Amen. And I, I've, heard, I've heard preachers that just had to say something. Amen. Didn't say much, but they had to say something. And then, thank God, I've also heard some, some men that had a word from God, and it's been some time with the Lord. And they didn't just say something. They had something to say. Amen. And there's a difference between the two. Paul knew the difference when it came to uh, taking the opportunity to speak and taking the opportunity to have a moment to uh, share something something uh, that was upon his heart and the king had given him the opportunity to do that and had permitted him to speak for himself and just like any good Christian should uh, the Bible said that Paul was excited and Paul was happy about the opportunity that he had uh, to speak and the reason why he was so happy is because he'd have the opportunity not to defend himself as an innocent man I don't believe when we come to this text that Paul was very concerned with whether or not this king saw him as innocent or not. I don't know if Paul was as concerned about being set free as much as he was about that king being set free. Not from the not from uh, uh, law and not from uh, bondage and as a lawbreaker uh, against man's laws, but the bondage that wrapped this king's soul up uh, from being a lawbreaker against God's holy divine law 
This king was lost. This king was a sinner. And Paul knew that he had an opportunity not just to share his innocence, but to share that man's guiltiness and how Paul once was a man who was guilty, but had been set free, had been redeemed, had been born again, had had all of the sins that were taking him to hell. And more than that, the sin of unbelief that was taking him to hell without Jesus in his heart and life. And he was able to share how he was able to exchange his sinfulness for Christ's sinlessness and be born again. Paul here takes an opportunity as a saved man to share the message of the gospel by way of his personal salvation testimony with the king. The Bible tells us, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to mention this later in the message, but if you'll notice, the Bible says in, uh, let's see, I wasn't planning on preaching this verse, but uh, the Bible says in uh, verse number 16 that when Paul was saved, he was called and was told uh, that he said, but rise. And Jesus says, Paul, in verse 16 of chapter 26, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of the things which thou hast seen, and those things in which uh, I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom I now send thee. The Bible talks about the day that Paul got saved. The Bible talks about how uh, he had saved him, not to just preach to the Gentiles, as our text verse mentions here. Year. But the Bible also says in the book of Acts that uh, earlier on in the book of Acts that he was he had saved him to not only preach to Jews and Gentiles, but to preach to kings as well. And we find here Paul is doing exactly what God had told him to do. No doubt the call of God upon his life brought was, was brought back to his mind as he has the opportunity to speak to a king. And God told Paul the day that he saved him, that he would use him to speak to kings, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we find him in chapter 26, and I'm trying to hurry this morning, uh, but in chapter 26, we find him giving his testimony as a saved man to a lost man. And that's what I want to preach on this morning, the testimony of a saved man. The testimony of a saved man. Let me say this. The testimony of a saved individual is a powerful thing. <clears throat> because your testimony is a, is, a, is a representative. It is literally a witness of the power of God in the converting of a human soul. Here we find Paul taking an opportunity to speak to this individual. And he doesn't give him a Roman's road. He doesn't give him a, Philipp a, Fli a Philippians pathway. He doesn't give him anything that we've been taught to give. He simply gives his testimony. And by the end of giving his testimony, the king had to say that you have been persuading me to be a Christian. Now it's sad that he attached the word almost to that. He didn't get saved. But the testimony of the believer brought this king. Just Paul sharing what Jesus did for him. It brought King Agrippa to a point of decision where he had to say yes or no. Sadly, Agrippa said no, but he had the opportunity to say yes. Can I submit to you this morning as we quickly look at a couple of things about this testimony that Paul had. Can I say this this morning? We'll look at Paul's testimony and in this testimony of the saved apostle Paul, we'll find glimpses of the testimony of every single one of us that has been saved by the grace of God. Number one, I want you to notice that when we look at this testimony of the saved apostle Paul, it number one tells us of interrogation. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 1. The Bible said, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And then the Bible says, Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. He said, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Because, uh, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Paul here in these verses is being called into question for the actions that his salvation has led him to do. 
His salvation is what is fueling everything that Paul is doing in his life and what the working, the outworking of the inward work, the inward salvation that Jesus put in him as he works out that salvation, as he does what God would have for him to do. His salvation brings him to this point of questioning. His obedience to Christ is what brings him before this judgment bar. It is, he is being brought into question simply because of the fact that he is a Christian and that he doesn't just claim to be a Christian, but he lives like a Christian. Can I say this? The world does not care whether you call yourself a Christian or not. But if you want to get the interrogation of the world, you want to be called into question, you want to ruffle some feathers in the world that we live in, try living like the Christian that you claim to be. Amen. The world that we live in will call our Christianity in, into question just like the, this, uh, this uh, uh, government called in to question Paul's testimony of salvation. And let me tell you this, they will call it into question. And they will argue with you and they will interrogate you. And if you spend any time trying to share your testimony and share the gospel, don't be surprised if you get cussed at. Don't be surprised if you're talked down upon. And I'm telling you, as a Christian, you may be a warm-blooded man just like I am. You may be a lady that, uh, you know, you're not going to just take anything sitting down. You're not going to let anybody run all over you. But can I say this? I'm just as much of a warm-blooded man as anybody else in this building. But can I, if you're going to be a witness for Christ, you've got to be, you've got to make sure that you're thick-skinned instead of thin-skinned. Right. Amen. If you're representing Jesus and the world out here that you're witnessing to hates Jesus and they cuss at you, the last thing that you need to do to be a testimony for Christ is bloody a nose, fatten a lip or blacken an eye. I'll be honest with you, this flesh wants to do that. I'm telling you, I've, I've had people, I'm the, one, of the, one of the things that as a, as a man in my flesh... Now, don't y'all judge me because everybody in here is the same way. But I'm, I'm just, the Bible says in the book of James, confess your faults one to another. And you, uh, Amen. That's what we need to do. Here's one of my faults. In my flesh, the last thing I like to do is to be talked down to. Amen. I don't like to be treated like I'm an idiot. I don't like to be, I don't like to be uh, somebody act like I'm ignorant. Amen. I don't like to be treated as if I don't know anything because of my age. Those things bother me. My flesh gets bothered from time to time. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Amen. But as a Christian, I don't need to let this be in control. Amen. Paul, notice how Paul responds. He's standing before them accused as a criminal that he did not commit, uh, for crimes he did not commit. He is being interrogated for no wrongdoing. I promise you, if, 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 if just about anybody in this building, they throw you behind bars for something that you didn't do, you'd, probably, you'd, be, you'd be making all kinds of noise saying, hey, I need my phone call. I need my phone call. Somebody's got to know I didn't do this. Amen. You know, you get, you get hauled off to jail for uh, something you didn't do. It'll be hard for you and for me uh, to uh, be okay with our right to remain silent. Amen. From the moment those handcuffs click on your wrist, from the moment you're hauled off before a judgment bar like Paul was, almost all of us would be telling somebody, hey, you've got the wrong guy. You've messed up. But here, Paul doesn't respond that way. He's before this group. They're accusing him of wrongdoing. And in the midst of it, he knows that there's a superior plan behind why he's here. That's where we've got to get to, church. We've got to realize that the circumstances in our life, God is sovereign and God is in control. And he's putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And he is arranging our steps. Does, does the Bible not say that the steps, uh, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord? The Lord is the one ordering our steps, ordaining our steps. Everywhere we go, we're there because of the permissive will of God. 
God allows those things to happen so you and I can be in the situations we're in so that we can fulfill His purpose there. Paul had grown enough in his walk with the Lord from the day that he's testifying about, from the day that he got saved between then and now, he has grown enough in the Lord to where he realizes that there's a bigger plan at play than me being accused of wrongdoing. I don't have to defend myself, but I need to be faithful to why God has me here. I'm looking and Paul is examining why am I here? And Paul knows everywhere he goes. God has already told him the day he saved him. I saved you uh, not just to go to heaven. I saved you not just to miss hell. I saved you not just to let you pray and to give you the good things that salvation gives. But I saved you that you might be a witness to others. And the Bible says here he realizes that during this time of interrogation. Notice what verse number 1 says. The Bible says that Paul was humble. Verse number one, that's what the Bible said. And Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. He says then, Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. Isn't it interesting that Paul did not say anything? The Bible does not give us a record of Paul speaking any words until he was given permission to say something. Yeah, I believe with all of my heart if this king would not have given Paul permission as much as he wanted to give the gospel to this man, he got, Paul, had to let, Paul had to let God ordain for him to have the open door to give the gospel to this man. He was not going to step around the authority of the king. He was permitted to speak. And I believe all of that is in the divine plan of God. I believe God is fingering around on the heart of King Agrippa and dealing with him about letting Paul speak for himself. The Bible said here that he waits for the opportunity uh, to be allowed to speak. He was not rude. He was not arrogant. He did not speak out of turn. Paul exercised humility. And can I say this? When you and I go through times of interrogation, you know what you and I need to do? We need to be humble. Amen. Philippians chapter number 2 tells us one of the chief characteristics of our Savior was the fact that he was humble. He was, he, was, he was willing to be humiliated. He was humble even to the death of the cross. He was humble. Then number two, not only was he humble, can I say this this morning? Even in the midst of being interrogated, even in the midst of having to answer for even for his innocence, Paul was holy. Notice what the Bible said in verse 2. He said, I think myself angry. Is that what he says? I think myself furious. I think myself enraged. Tell me if this sounds like the generation we're living in. I think myself offended. <laughs> Do you realize that the Bible says the people that walk with God, nothing shall offend them? If you're walking with God, you're going to be hard to offend. And here's the reason why. You'll realize you don't deserve anything anyhow. If you deserve worse than what you get, you won't be offended by what you get. Paul was holy. Paul knew he deserved hell, but he was getting the opportunity to speak for himself. He was getting the opportunity to give the gospel. Paul said, I think myself happy. And in doing so, he is exercising an element of holiness in his life. He was not filled with rage over the path that the Lord had brought him to. He did not overreact. He, by the way, we are too often times, even you and I as Christians, we overreact to the situations that we're brought into. I'm telling you, uh, and again, this is the battle of our flesh versus our spirit. But I'm telling you, know, you, you have to talk to two or three people in India trying to get your... You know, whatever situation covered over the phone with a business you're working with, it's hard not to overreact. Anybody, you don't have to answer this out loud, but anybody in the building, by the time you got to the third or fourth person that's somewhere, you know, in Zimbabwe or India or somebody, did anybody, you just look at the phone and say, can I please talk to somebody that speaks English? Amen. Amen. You ever do that? <laughs> that's an overreaction. <laughs> Confess our faults one to another. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, we're, we are tempted to overreact. When we have a situation frustrates us, we're tempted to overreact. How about we do this? 
Paul responded with holiness. Paul responded with happiness. He understood there's a reason why I'm going through what I'm going through. The Bible said he did not overreact. He chose to be happy even when he was on trial. Verse 2 says that Paul knew that he was being accused of wrongdoing, but still chose to be happy. Happiness is based upon happenings in our life. Therefore, this scene, this scene here in verse number two seems to be a paradox. He is not only talking about joying in the Lord, but truly being physically happy. I'm amazed that he uses the word happiness here. Because in order happiness is a human emotion. Joy is a Christian choice. The Bible says joy in the Lord. The Bible said the joy of the Lord is our strength. The reason why that's joy is because our situation with God never changes. You can always have joy in the Lord even when the bottom falls out of your life. But you won't always be happy. What level of Christianity are we observing Paul at that he can be in this situation and be not just joyous in the Lord in something that never changes, but to be true, and it's inspired in the King James Bible. We know that is the truth of God. God testified that was the emotion in Paul's heart. He said, I think myself Happy. Happy is a positive response to the happenings in your life, to the events in your life. And Paul's event was not a happy situation, but he was happy anyway. I would to God that God would grow in this preacher and in this congregation the ability to see beyond our circumstances. To react and to uh, respond with emotion that does not always have to be tethered to what is going on in our life. To see beyond the bad and see the blessings in what God is doing. Amen. Instead of, and I'm not trying to pick on him just because he confessed his faults. Because most of us have been there too. And if you didn't do it, you wanted to. So you're just as guilty as someone who did. Amen. How about instead of saying, can I just speak to somebody that speaks English? We might could look at that and say, I have an opportunity to speak to someone I would never get to speak to on the other side of the world. That would be the way Paul responded. And as long as he understands enough English to understand Jesus loves you and he'll save you. Well, and he's got he's to be on the phone with you. They're not alive. Have you ever thought about that? They're not supposed to hang up on you. Their, their call's being recorded. You can hang up on them, but they've got to be professional to you. What that means is, is now you've got a captive audience. And does it matter whether they're captive in America, in South Carolina, or does it matter if they're captive on the other side of the globe? As long as they understand Jesus saves and that he loves, he loves the world, and that includes them, whether they're sitting at a desk or riding the back of a camel. Amen. That's what Paul, that's Paul's dealing with here. He was holy. He thought himself happy. This, this was a holy action rather than a sinful reactionary action. He was humble. He was holy. But then think about this. Remember, <coughs> verse 2, King Agrippa represents everything that is coming against the Apostle Paul. King Agrippa represents the government that is accusing him of wrongdoing. And not only in this time of interrogation did he respond with humility, not only did he respond with holiness, but he responded with honoring this king. Look at verse number 2 with me. He says, I think myself happy King Agrippa. He calls him King Look at verse number three. Not only did he honor King Agrippa number one by calling him king, giving him that title that he has earned and has been secured to him and given to him. He didn't call him a scoundrel. Amen. 
He didn't call him trash. He didn't call him worthless. He didn't call him any insult because he is being accused. He calls him king. But then if you look at verse number three, not only did he honor King Agrippa by calling him king, but he also honored him by complimenting him kindly. Look at verse number three. He said, he said, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee. He says, verse two, I'm excited just to be in your presence. He said, I'm thankful you're giving me the opportunity to speak. He, he, he humbly called him king. He compliments him. He's saying in verse 2, I'm thankful to you that you exercised your authority and letting me do this. I'm before, uh, before he gets into the compliments, uh, specifically in verse 3, he already is complimenting him by being thankful and grateful that the king even allowed him to talk. Amen. When was the last time... And I'm t I'm, I, I, I've never even considered this until just now, and I'm preaching to myself more than I am you. When was the last time we witnessed to somebody and thanked them for the opportunity to speak with them? Thank you for letting me speak to you today. Thank you for letting me put this track in your hand. Thank you for letting me represent my Savior to you today. I think that would be a good practice. And I wonder... If we were as humble as Paul is here, when we are brought into, even into difficult situations, when it, comes to, to, when it comes to honoring the Lord and serving the Lord, if we were as humble as he was, if we were as holy as he was in this response, and if we were as honoring as he is, I wonder if our efforts to win a soul to Christ would be more effective. The Bible said that King Agrippa was faced with a decision and he not only was he given the opportunity to say yes to the gospel, yes to Jesus, he said, I'm, I was almost convinced. Now let me say this, I don't think it was because Paul was not convincing. And I don't think it was because the Holy Spirit was not working. But you'd be surprised, even with the best presentation, even with somebody like the Apostle Paul standing before you, the hard heart of man is something very difficult to crack. It takes the Holy Ghost of God to soften the heart and for man to believe the gospel and be born again. I'm telling you, salvation is something that is very simple, but our rebellion is something that is, that is very deeply rooted in us. If you will say yes to Jesus, Jesus will save you. But you've got to make sure that you're that you got you've got to make sure that you reject what that hard heart and that flesh wants and you say yes to Jesus Christ. I wonder if we would see more people brought to that place if we responded the way Paul did to this interrogation. Look at the compliment in verse 3. He says he compliments him kindly. He says in verse 3, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Not only does he call him king, but he gives him compliments. He thanks him with gratitude for letting him speak. And he said, by the way, I'm not just thankful for that, but I'm thankful that I'm able to speak to somebody this morning that knows what they're talking, to, talking about. If he says to him, I know if you'll hear me patiently, you'll understand everything that I'm about to say to you. Obviously, King Agrippa has had some sort of, of teaching in the law. The Bible said that he is an expert in the customs of the Jews. He's, he, he's, not, he's not just a novice. He's not just a beginner. He's an expert. He knows what he's talking about. And Paul knows that about him and compliments him for it. I think that it is a good practice to get into when it comes to sharing your faith. I, I've, done, I've done it often. And, I, and some of the folks that have went with me visiting and things, uh, that uh, you know, my, I've had folks go with me and want me to kind of instruct them on how to knock on doors and how to talk to folks and, and things throughout the years. 
And one thing I've always told them, there some of the young men in this church that I've talked to and went with, I've shared with them the same thing. I said, when you go on somebody's porch, make sure to be very vigilant to your surroundings. If that person has a, has a beautiful lawn, make sure you let them know. If you walked up on a beautiful house, make sure to let them know. And even if you don't think their grass looks good, and you don't think their house looks good, I'm not saying lie to them, but find something to compliment them about. You'll be surprised how open people will be if you just compliment them. And I don't care what person you may come in contact with. There is something that you can share with them that will be kind and complimentary and positive. Even at the most, if they just open the door. I've started many conversations going door knocking just by saying thank you for opening the door to us. And I'll t I'm not going to take much of your time. I just, wanted to share the, I just wanted to share Jesus Christ with you. I wanted to invite you to church and tell you how to go to heaven. And I'll tell them that. And, just, and, and I'll start the conversation with, I'm so glad you opened up the door to us. I know we live in a day where it's, it's a fearful thing to crack open that door. But I'm thankful that you did and gave me the opportunity to talk to you today. I think that we would see much more done for the glory of God if we would be willing to act this way in the situations that God brings us in. He called him king and he complimented him kindly. I'm not going to preach anymore this morning. I've got several other points that I could bring. We might pick this up, Lord willing, on Wednesday night. Um, uh, you know, I, I know we've got a couple of Sunday mornings now. We've got two messages on top of each other, and I want to finish the other one before we begin this one. Um, but I, I didn't know the Lord was going to deal with us the way he dealt with us. I thought I was going to just preach these things and be done, but that never happens to me here. I, ha I, I, can, I could preach this message in 25 minutes somewhere else. But for some reason, preaching to you guys, I can't. I just can't do it. Amen. And uh, so, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you ever see me do that, you'll probably say preacher's not being personal enough. He's not. Pre he's preaching to some other group. He's not preaching to us. But I'm telling you this morning. I think we've learned enough lessons this morning that we could take home and have something to chew on. There will be times in our life where you'll be called into question just for being a Christian. And I'll say this, the farther we go toward the end of everything, the closer we get to the, to the events of the book of Revelation and the events of Bible prophecy, I'll tell you this, the, least, uh, friend, the, the, the less friendly this world will be to the Christian. You know, here in America we're blessed, but we're living in a day and a generation where Christians on the other side of the world are sealing their faith in blood. There has never been a time in the history of this world from the time that the first Christian got saved by the grace of God from the very first time the church went marching forth sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and fulfilling the Great Commission there has never been a time where Christians have stopped sealing their faith in blood there are places like this nation where we're blessed to where being here this morning we're not going to be hauled off to jail we're not going to be beheaded if you're, if you're in Iraq and you do what we did this morning, you shared the gospel like I shared the gospel this morning, your preacher would have to lose his head for what he said this morning. There's places all over the world that it's like that. There's Christians being beaten and bloodied and scarred just for being a Christian. And we here in America get so offended if someone calls us a bad name or raises their voice or talks down to us and looks at us like... We don't know what we're talking about. But I'll say this too. As, as, as horrible as it is, everything that's going on around the world to other Christians, and as really, to be honest, as, as wrong of it is for us to respond the way we do when we're not facing what they're facing, and they would love to face the level of persecution that we're facing. There's no telling what they could get done here with the level of persecution that we have. Very little to none. The only persecution we get might be a bad word here and there. Might be a law trying to restrict our liberties a little bit. But I'll say this, I'm also not ignorant of the fact that because this is our environment, this is our culture, and this is what we know, it is bothersome to the Christians in America what we go through. 
I want to give you that reminder this morning that when the world interrogates us, when they call us into question, when they, when they bring our faith into question and try to, try to cast doubt upon what we already know, let me encourage you, be humble, be holy, be honoring, because you have a bigger mission to your existence than sometimes we allow to meet our eyes. If we're, not just, we're not just here for no reason. We're here to be a witness. We are here to give the testimony of a saved individual so that those that are lost can hear what God can do for a person, not just a message, not just a doctrine, but what the real God of heaven really did in the life of someone they can see, someone they can look at, someone they can talk to, someone they can ask questions to. Thank God for what God did for Paul. But when you have a skeptic in front of you, they can't ask Paul questions about what God did for him. You know what they can do? They can't ask you about what God did in your heart and life. That testimony is a powerful thing. And it will begin, oftentimes as it did for Paul, with a time of interrogation. But in those times, remember, think yourself happy. Amen. Think yourself happy. Seize the opportunity that God has given. And let's shine bright in a dark world for the cause of Christ. Every head bowed.